me okay? Yep. I am absolutely humbled and grateful to have the opportunity to address you on this glorious afternoon. I will begin with a thought from the wonderful Maya Angelou, who recently passed away. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said and what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. On behalf of my class, I will repeat the thanks of Stephanie and Madeline. Uh, I thank Tom Green for his fearless, visionary leadership that made us feel inspired. Louise Crowley for her astute wisdom in the direction of our program and for making us feel well cared for because she filled needs before we even knew we had them. Jericho Parms for her kind words and gentle reminders that made us feel we were on track month after month every semester. John Solopoto, our audiovisual guru, who always made us feel we could hear and be heard, see and be seen. And to David Wojong and the rest of the BCFA faculty who have imprinted us with their enthusiasm, diligence, and joy of our craft. They made us feel we are writers. We also have immense gratitude for our loved ones who are present today and those who are not. I've been told that when a person first sees the face of creator spirit, this universal energy that moves us to create, it's usually in the face of someone you love. You are all a part of this. Indeed, you are at the heart of it. I didn't come into BCFA with this class. I was starting my second semester when they arrived, but I was so impressed with them that when I got home after residency, I wrote a letter to a friend, a third semester student, in which I said, did you meet any of the first semester students? They are amazing and seriously cool. <laughs> what I meant by that was I didn't sense any timidity about them. They seemed so ready and willing to take hold of their BCFA experience and eager to make it their own. They held their own readings in addition to the regular student readings. They bonded quickly and jumped fearlessly into the world. When I weighed the pros and cons of adding a semester to my studies, the big pro on my list was that I would get to graduate with this class. I'm so proud to share this stage with them today. When I said I was preparing this speech, a friend said to me, it's hard, isn't it? It's not your usual college graduation speech. It's not like your undergraduate's about to take on the world. I took issue with that because I believe we are about to take on the world. It may be the world at large, or the literary world, or the world that comprises the space between our ears. Perhaps the most pressing and present to us now is the one called the post-MFA world. It is often described as a kind of void furnished with the busy details of our lives, commuting, work deadlines, meetings, laundry, cooking, shuttling children to and from activities, taking pets on walks or to the vet. This world is voiced with a chattering noise that drowns out our own creative voices. It is said post-MFA writers sink into this void after graduation and often are never heard from again. This is a daunting obstacle before us. However, will we take it on? I will answer this question with a kind of a joke, not really a joke. I first heard it on an episode of the television show, The West Wing. It goes like this. This guy is walking down the street when he falls in a hole. The walls are so steep he can't get out. A doctor passes by and the guy shouts up, hey, can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole, and moves on. Then a priest comes along, and the guy shouts out, Father, I'm down in this hole, can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer, throws it down in the hole, and moves on. Then a friend walks by. Hey Joe, it's me, can you help me out? And the guy, the friend, jumps in the hole. Our guy says, are you stupid? Now we're both down here. The friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. For us, the way out 
is comprised of many different pieces of experience we've all crafted during our time here. We each hold a piece of the puzzle, just as siblings in a family all have different pieces of the same memory of the same occurrences. Each of us has dealt with frustration and fear of the blank page or computer screen. Each of us has confronted loneliness and rejection uh, and the rejection of our work. Each of us has felt confusion and uncertainty over whether we should be doing this in the first place. We've all hit that point where we're stuck in our work on a poem, short story, or essay, and have no idea where to go with it. We've dealt with all these obstacles, and we managed to find a way, a way to be shared with a friend when he or she falls down the same hole. But we can only access this information, these pieces that will be widely scattered after today, if we stay connected with each other in a deep and meaningful manner. And I'm quite serious about the deep and meaningful part. I know we're mostly connected via social media, but this is not the kind of connection I'm talking about. I'm talking about moving beyond surface communication, beyond likes and retweets. And really, I'm not talking about reading each other's work, although that can be a useful and necessary part of all this too. I mean talking. I mean sharing. I mean cultivating the universal energy that makes us want to create. You know what I mean because we've been doing it for the past 10 days. But how do we do it in the real world? I think it starts with giving ourselves permission to reach out to each other. We are bold while we're here, and it's easy to knock on someone's dorm room door or sit down across from them at dinner. But after today, it may not feel so easy, especially if it involves, as I am suggesting, picking up a phone or making a direct request via email. Really, it's our responsibility, each and every one of us, to reach out when we need a reader a bit of advice, or simply a compassionate ear who knows what we're talking about. Recently, I've had several friends in separate instances tell me they could have used my input or just wanted to hear my voice, but they didn't call. Why? The answer usually goes something like, oh, I didn't want to bother you, or I didn't want to intrude. But what else is a friend for? And when do you finally make a call if it's not going to be in that moment when you most need a friend? We don't reach out and then wonder why we feel like a flower faded and wilted because it hasn't been watered. When we connect with each other, we spark the energy that fuels our creativity. I encourage you, my classmates, to make phone calls to each other and write letters or lengthy emails to, in effect, become creator spirit for each other. Yes, it takes time, but you'll find as you speak or write to your friend, you're discovering anew who you are as a writer. And when you do connect, communicate as openly and honestly as you can. Share as fearlessly as you can. Ask each other important questions. This might sound heavy, but you'd be surprised by how a question or an innocent observation can set your wheels spinning. A VCFA alumnus traveling in Guatemala sent me a postcard. It was graced with the gorgeously weathered face of an elderly woman who was on her way to prayers. He wrote of how inspired he was by the landscape of Guatemala, and in the last line, he said, he hoped I would give myself time to write in new and beautiful places. That postcard inspired me to do the study abroad program here and to go to Puerto Rico last semester. Another dear friend, in a letter, once asked me, where is the light? That was two years ago, and yet the question so inspired and enthralled me that I find I've been answering it in my writing, fiction and nonfiction, ever since. These two communications changed the shape of my writing life. Imagine what can happen for all of us if we continue to engage with each other. Of course, you don't have to do this. My nine-year-old son, he started collecting Pokemon cards and learning all he can about these little pocket monsters who have a variety of powers. And because he's learning about them, I'm learning about them too. I know that Pokemon can evolve into higher forms of themselves. 
The higher form of a Pokemon will even have a different name from his original form. Charmander will evolve into Charmeleon. Charmeleon will evolve into Charizard. My son insisted I put in an example. <laughs> I've also learned that the most valued Pokemon have a choice about how they evolve, and they can evolve into many things. I think we can take a page from the Pokemon and step up and choose how we evolve from here. You can choose how you'll be in this post-MFA world. You can choose how you'll show up as a writer, or you can choose not to remain a writer at all. I, for one, hope you will keep choosing to continue your writing life, just as you chose to come here to BCFA. I hope you will choose to stay connected with each other, as you, and as you do, partake of the support you will need to conquer worlds. We came here for learning, and the learning has been fantastic, but we also came for community. Please don't leave here without it. We will miss this place, but I believe if we stay true and connected to each other, BCFA will always be within us. So I'll end with the closing words of the play Angels in America by Tony Kushner. I'll paraphrase a tiny bit here, but know when I say life, I mean the writing life. The time has come. By now. You are all fabulous creatures, each and every one, and I bless you. More life. The great work begins. Your great work, my great work, our great work. It all begins. Thank you.